All right, I'm saying it's 5.59, almost 6. We're going to go ahead and start the roll call to make sure everybody's present. Um, Jason Burdine. Here. Addie Helliger. Addie. Hello. Just checking roll. Is that? Okay, that, I'll unmute it. We'll check and roll. Thank you. Thank you. Dave Rosenthal. I am here. Allison Drew. I'm here. Grail James. I'm here. Jim Rice. I'm here. Kristen Tossan. Yes, I'm here. I'm going to go down the staff list. Deanna Saavedra. I'm here. Joe Rodriguez. Joe Rodriguez. All right, Beth Martinez. I'm here. Brian Gwynn. I am here. Gwynn Touche. I am here. Veronica Sofer. This is Veronica, I am here. Oscar Perez. This is Oscar, I am here. Long Pham. This is Long and I am present. Anthony and Delicato. This is Anthony and I'm present. Rob Scamardo. Yes, sir, this is Rob, I'm here. David Ryder. This is Chief Ryder and I am here. Joe Rodriguez, are you here? Dr. Dupree, uh, on the chat, it says that uh, Dr. Rodriguez left the conversation, so maybe he's trying to reconnect. Yeah, he was having some technology issues a little earlier today, but I think we can go ahead and get started. Dr. So, Dupree, this is okay. Joe, I'm here. Very good, thank you, Joe. All right, yes, Mr. President, I will turn the meeting over to you. Thank you, Dr. Dupree. It is 6.02 p.m. and this meeting is hereby called to order. We have the presence of a quorum attending on a video conference. Notice of this meeting has been posted online and physically at the District Central Administration Building for at least 72 hours. March 16, 2020, Governor Greg Abbott granted a request by Attorney General Ken Paxton to temporarily suspend a limited number of open meeting laws to the extent necessary to allow telephonic or video conference meetings in response to the coronavirus COVID-19 in accordance with those suspended rules, Fort Bend ISD certifies the following. Although members of the board are not gathered in a central physical location, we do have a quorum in attendance at this meeting by video conference. This meeting is being held by video conference because the convening at one location of a quorum of the governmental body is not appropriate during the COVID-19 public health emergency. Based on current guidance from federal, state, and county authorities concerning large gatherings and social distancing during the COVID-19 public health emergency, there is no established location for an audience to observe the meeting. However, the meeting is audible and accessible through a YouTube link that was timely and appropriately provided to the public and media as part of the meeting posting through a news release and via the district website. As we would at any, as we would at any in-person meeting, members of the public who have followed the standard instructions for registering to speak during the public comment portion will be allowed three minutes to speak. All other meeting procedures will adhere to board adopted procedures to the extent practicable. An audio and video recording of the meeting is being made and will be available to the public on the district's websites. Since the audience is listening through an audio link, all board members, staff, and other participants will identify themselves by name when they speak. Board votes will be taken by a roll call. To start our meeting this evening, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. 
I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, independent with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for our, or actually, um, yeah, please remain standing for our silent invocation. While we're uh, standing for our invocation this evening, let's please think about those who are going through difficult times right now. I know um, it's not really easy and uh, there's a lot of unknowns. So please keep those in your thoughts as we have a moment here to um, think about those who are in need. All right, you may be seated. First on our agenda this evening is our audience items. Nobody signed up this evening to speak. So we will be moving right along. Um, no, the, no citizens have signed up to speak. Okay, let's see here. With that being said, Dr. Dupree, um, let's start with our audience item. Yes, sir, we have one information item this meeting. It will take a few minutes because there are several parts to it. But what we wanted to do was to provide the board an update on our response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you've received some updates via email and we've done a great deal of communication in public, but we thought it would be appropriate this evening to provide a few more updates. We're addressing our three priorities at this time, minimizing the spread of the illness, supporting our students who rely on FBISD for healthy meals, and perhaps the highest priority item in addition is developing learning opportunities to re-engage our students. As you know, we've had um, many essential staff working during the last week while the district has been closed and the focus of their work has been these three priorities. So I'm gonna allow Oscar Perez to begin with um, to talk about minimizing the spread of the illness and talking about some of the things we've done in his organization regarding our facilities, Oscar. Thank you, Dr. Dupree. In summary, with schools currently closed through April 10th, the operations division is working to accelerate work normally scheduled for summer. We're also supporting drive through meal service and staff are sanitizing all buildings. Design and construction, the 2018 bond packages are being expedited to take advantage of the district shutdown and contractors normally working outside of the school day are working in the schools during the day. The contractor working the child nutrition department warehouse building was notified of the employee who tested positive and has chosen to work other sites for the rest of the week. Design work for bond packages continue. Non-bond construction activities continue. Design and construction staff have transitioned to optional work from home status. We currently have 17 active packages under construction. Two additional packages are expected to be presented to the board for consideration in April. We anticipate starting construction on an additional 18 packages in a May, June time period. Facilities and operations. The maintenance and operations team have been working hard to stay ahead of the COVID-19. The custodial staff use spring break to disinfect buildings. The disinfectant that we use throughout the district is on the EPA's COVID-19 disinfectant list. Staff dispenses disinfectant using spray bottles or an electrostatic sprayer. The disinfectants and the cleaning protocols Fort Bend ISD utilizes are consistent with the best practices of mitigating the risk of viruses. Operations at any given time maintains about two months supply of disinfectant and inventory at all facilities. Staff increased our order quantity realizing supply availability could be impacted 
Operations received 50 cases last Friday and expect an additional 50 cases this Friday. Staff maintains soap in every dispenser and, this, and in the supply closet of every campus. With schools sparsely staffed, custodial operations have taken advantage of empty spaces and accelerated work normally performed during summer months. Maintenance staff took advantage of spring break to validate that all sinks were working properly. Staff has repaired sinks not working in order parts to repair those that were not. As of today, staff has received replacement parts. This affected less than 1% of our sinks district wide. All sinks will be operable before students return in April. Maintenance staff is also utilizing this time to perform preventive maintenance and to complete outstanding work orders. To provide deep cleaning, a Kyvac cleaning system is used at every high school and athletic facility to sanitize restrooms, showers, and training spaces. Staff has reached out to our approved restoration service contractors and have commitments from them to assist us with any disinfected needed beyond our capability. <clears throat> Transportation. Installation of the compressed natural gas fueling station is on track to be completed by the end of May ahead of delivery of the 30 additional CNG buses. District mechanics continue to address vehicle maintenance in expectation of buses being utilized during summer months. Fort Bend ISD and Gold Star drivers and monitors are being paid during this time and our bus drivers are on standby to be utilized as necessary. This concludes my report. All righty, thank you, Oscar. Brian, I'd like for you to go ahead, please, and talk about how we're serving healthy meals to our um, students right now. Yes, sir, this is Brian Gwynn, Chief Financial Officer, and I'd like to start out by saying that we started serving meals at 11 sites beginning on March 16th. Those sites were Dulles High School, Elkins High School, First Colony Middle School, Hightower High School, Hodges Bend Middle School, Hipner High School, McAuliffe Middle School, Missouri City Middle School, Ridgepoint High School, Fortarsha Middle School, and Travis High School. We offer two pickup times each day at those sites from 7.30 in the morning until 9 a.m. for breakfast and lunch, and then again from 11.30 until 1 p.m. for lunch only. We're averaging about 5,200 meals per day being served. And about one third of those meals are breakfast and lunch pickup. So about 1,750 meals are picked up uh, for breakfast and lunch. We are planning to add 12 additional sites on Wednesday of this week, March 25th. Those additional sites will be Ridgegate Elementary, Briargate Elementary, Blue Ridge Elementary, Heritage Rose, Burton, Goodman, Rosa Parks, Ridgemont, Lantern Lane, Armstrong, Mission Glen, and Mission Bend. And I will point out that those are all of our title campuses. So we'll have meal services at each of those campuses beginning on Wednesday of this week. They will also have the twice daily pickup once at 730 and once at 1130. So no changes to the scheduling there. The thing that I'll also mention in terms of sanitation, I know that is a concern that a lot of the public has. Most, I'd say most all, all of our meal handlers are food trained in meal uh, handling and preparations and follow all safety guidelines that are required by both local health authorities as well as state health authorities. And they undergo a regular clean of the sites that where the meals are prepped. Although I will say that most of the meals that we are doing are ready packaged so that there is very little food handling that is required with these actual meals that we're preparing. And again, about 5,200 meals per day is what we're doing. And we anticipate that that operation will continue with the addition of the 12 sites beginning on Wednesday. And that concludes my report. Brian, would you, you or Joe speak a little bit about the work we're doing to identify ways to increase participation in some of our schools? I'll let Joe answer specifically to the efforts that some of the title campuses have undertaken to do that. Dr. Dupree, can you please repeat that? I'm having some issues hearing the complete sentence. Or the question we were asking about the efforts we're undertaking to make sure all students that are can participate to increase participation at some of our schools yes sir uh one of the things that we've done is we've uh, released a survey to gather information from the different communities really just trying to isolate what are some of the things that we can do as a school district to ensure that there's increased participation a lot of the results uh, thematically what they shared with us was, 
you know, having additional schools closer to their neighborhoods uh, would increase participation. Obviously, looking uh, at the times was uh, critical as well. There are some concerns with transportation, but we feel as a administration that by increasing the number of schools, especially in, in these communities, that we will increase the percentage of participation as well. Very good, thank you so much. Okay, so those are our top two priorities. Yes, the um, What I'd like to do now is ask Deanna to go ahead and discuss our efforts right now related to returning our students to instruction during the next week or so. Deanna? Yes, uh, this is Deanna Saavedra, Deputy Superintendent. Thank you, Dr. Dupree. Um, the staff has been working really hard, as Dr. Dupree said, so that we could begin to transition the organization in this time of crisis from uh, instruction inside the classroom to uh, a virtual or online platform to re-engage our students in the learning process. So the particular departments, it, it's been a collective effort across all departments, but primarily we've had our academic affairs team, our department of school leadership team, and our organizational transformation team hard at work over the last week uh, to develop systems and structures. So as I go through to share with you the work that we've been engaged in to really relaunch this um, in the next few weeks. Uh, I want to organize the information in the way that we've begun to work on it through phases. Um, our initial phase was to analyze capacity. We moved into the second phase, which was building structures. I'll also describe what um, online student engagement will look like as we move into that phase. And then finally, online learning where students will be uh, and families will be engaged in course curriculum content. So uh, we began our work first uh, because we are one of the most diverse school districts in the nation to determine what is our capacity to uh, shift to an online or virtual platform. The good news is, is that we were well positioned to do that because of the work that we've done the last three years with our learning management system and our Schoology tool. Um, a lot of our staff are, are acclimated to using that tool and students are used to working through that platform um, in their classrooms um, for the last three years. But to develop, uh, so we developed a survey and pushed that out to our families and to our staff so that we could determine what is the capacity. What needs do we have in terms of hardware? What needs might we need to address in terms of internet access? And what tools uh, do people need at their disposal in order to be able to do this? Uh, we did this capacity analysis beginning with leaders. Then we transitioned to teachers. And um, last week, we launched the survey for our families. We've gathered a lot of information up to this point. Uh, families have until the end of today uh, to continue to complete that survey. Uh, the early information indicates that we've got about 30% of our families as of yesterday who had participated in completing the survey. Today, we had our call center alive and well so that they could continue to work with families who may not have had access to the survey online so that we could get them the information that we needed. Long's team is um, Long Fam uh, with technology. His team is gathering the information so that they can begin to formulate a plan uh, to deploy uh, hardware and or online access um, preliminarily so that uh, prior to, to launching um, this online platform. As we moved into the next phase, there were a number of different structures and systems that we needed to be mindful of and build uh, again so that we could be thoughtful in the rollout of this uh, virtual or online platform. We created a design team uh, that consists of members from across all departments. That design team was really charged with developing the system structures and processes needed uh, to continue to guide the work. Um, we also developed, have developed an online training plan for both campus leaders and teachers so that they can begin to engage and acclimate themselves to the online tools that they'll need to be to deliver instruction, engage students and families. 
We've also developed specific teacher expectations by level um, that include information associated with online learning. And uh, when we think about instruction in general, whether that's in the classroom or whether through an online platform, there are four basic things that we need to keep in mind as we think about instruction. One is how do we deliver, deliver I'm sorry, and model content? Uh, how do we uh, provide opportunities for students to practice and reflect on their learning? What kind of feedback can we provide students? And then what are opportunities for us to conference with students? So when we think about that in an online platform, delivery and modeling can happen via videoing lessons and pushing those out via Schoology. Uh, developing systems, again, for practice and reflection for students. Um, assessing what students are submitting and providing them feedback and then developing opportunities for conferencing. As we've, we've built these expectations for teachers, we've also laid out specific information about how they might structure their day so that they have time to plan accordingly, that they have time to uh, schedule our uh, business hours or office hours, if you will, uh, for families to um, engage with them in video conferencing and um, for them to provide feedback to students. So as I said, all of that is outlined and ready to be pushed to teachers so that we can begin to, uh, to communicate those expectations. Uh, we've also developed daily slash weekly schedules um, for families um, that give information about how much instructional time by level uh, we might expect for families to engage in learning. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, kindergarten students, as we think about them, they might uh, engage in maybe uh, an hour to 90 minutes a day at best. Um, and we've given um, we will be sharing with families information about what contents should they cover during a given day, how much time much might they spend, how much time might they spend reading with students, and all of that is flexible in terms of how parents structure that. So we've given them good, clear guidance, but with a, um, a multitude of flexibility so that they can work through that process um, as a family. Um, we've also developed curriculum supports for our teachers in terms of developing lesson plan protocols and providing them with exemplars so that they know how and what to do to plan an, an online learning lesson. In those lesson planning protocols, we specified uh, specific extensions for GT students specific strategies for sheltered instruction to address English language learners, and also specific information associated with modifying and accommodating for students with special needs. Um, as you all know, uh, Dina Hill and her staff have been communicating with officials at the state level, um, as well as uh, working with her team to develop a plan so that um, we can work through and amend any students' IEPs um, so that we can meet students' individual needs. Um, you all know that last week we launched our first at-home learning uh, resources page, and that was uh, our first step in building systems and structures so that parents could begin to re-engage their kids with fun, activities and begin to um, develop some structure in their households uh, as a readiness tool um, for more formal learning as we begin to launch those pieces. Our data indicates that we had over 30,000 hits to that particular link. So we know that our parents are accessing the information that we're posting to the website and the information that we're, we're pushing out. The next phase that I'll transition into is what we're doing to plan for the student engagement. That will begin the week of March 30th through April uh, the 2nd. And at this point, teachers will push out content to, again, assist families with using on -learn, online learning tools and setting up 
virtual spaces in their in their households, um, very much like um, the messaging that families and parents get during the first week of school when we talk about expectations in the classroom, communication expectations with teachers and things like that. Those are the types of engagement, communications and pushes that parents and families can expect from their teachers. Um, and then we'll transition into the formal online learning platform where students will begin to engage in curriculum content. And our launch for that is scheduled for April 3rd and we will continue uh, beyond that, um, you know, based on uh, the timeline for us to return back to school. At this time, as I said, teachers will push out online learning and specific course content associated with the curriculum and students will engage in learning using that online content. So at this point, I've shared uh, some very high level information about where we are in terms of working through and shifting from in-class instruction to a virtual online platform for learning. Ready, thank you, Deanna. This is Charles Dupree, superintendent. <clears throat> I do, I wanna kind of conclude by sharing a few other important pieces of information for the board's benefit. First of all, I want to be able, I want the board to be able to appreciate that everything you've just heard represents hours and hours and hours of hard work by a lot of good hardworking people. Our team has been very dedicated to meeting the needs of this community. And each thing you've heard reported on tonight has represented a substantial investment of time, including late evening hours and weekend hours to try to get our students fed kept them safe and clean and to make sure that we're getting back onto online learning as quickly as we can. Um, part of our, the work we're doing also includes a significant amount of time on the on the phone. Um, Deanna mentioned guidance from TEA. I'm I personally am on a call with the Commissioner of Education daily as well as routine calls often every day with other superintendents from our region coordinated by region four because we're all trying to work together. Um, Dr. Dina Hill, our executive director of special ed, and I have both been, we are both participating in the state's task force on how to address special education during this critical time. So we're in weekly, in twice a week, we're on calls with that task force from other leaders in the state. So there's a great deal of, a lot of work going on. And the other things I would share are that we're also working as a member of our community. Um, Anthony and I, as well as Deanna, um, Dr. Indelicato, of course, over our chief of staff and collaborative communities. We have been engaging more and more with local hospitals, as well as a county organized task force about how public education can support the, um, the, the children and the families of our first responders and healthcare workers. There is, at this point, there is an expectation that we have yet to see the surge that is to come and the taxing, the taxation that's going to occur on our hospitals and medical professionals. So they're wanting to make sure that those individuals have adequate health care options, or excuse me, child care options when they will be called to work very long hours um, for many days on end. So we're considering the possibility of opening our schools as child care facilities for health care workers. We're still in the discussion phases, but we have, we've had calls um, with healthcare professionals as well as the county task force related to that work. We're also doing our best to help um, local other organizations, nonprofits, as well as our, um, our faith-based organizations to provide them information to help them successfully support our community in regard to food, childcare, and other services. So we are, a community leader and liaison in these areas. Tomorrow, actually, I'm doing a, um, a video chat with about 34 different faith-based entities in our community to bring them up to speed to what we're doing and how they can best support our community and our efforts during this time. You're also seeing significant efforts of our communications a strategy. I'm proud that our team has, we are leading the way in terms of communication. I'm, we're getting very good feedback from our parents and our overall community and our students that everybody feels like they're very much in the know. They feel like we're being transparent and timely. So I 
appreciate our, our staff for their efforts there. As, and then finally, I would say that, you know, the, the message we continue to impart on every opportunity is that we are in a period of uncertainty. It's, it's impossible to know today whether we will be able to open and reopen our schools in April or May, even in August at this point, or if it's going to be even longer based on the cycle of the virus and our nation's ability to respond with the appropriate vaccines and, and response. So there's a great deal of uncertainty. For now, we have chosen to navigate that, look projecting out a few weeks at a time. But as school begins again, resumes, we are going to have to continue to weekly navigate how long we're going to be out. Of course, this is information that I'm working with daily with local health officials and state level officials. So I continue to keep the board informed in real time as I hear new updates. But of course, our E-team, the members on this call with you are actually meeting twice a day um, just to huddle and chat and make sure that we're keeping ahead on our priorities. And that has been one of our most important efforts as well as to be able to identify our priorities. And of course, everything at this point is focused on our response to COVID-19. But over the next three to four weeks, we will have, we know we'll begin to ramp up more some of the routine work of the things that we that we do day to day. But for right now, we need every individual's arm sleeves rolled up, dedicated to the task of resuming school in a new way. So we appreciate the board's patience and understanding as we focus on that. And I appreciate your consistent communication as well as the support you have expressed for our staff for their hard work. I just have to close by saying I'm exceptionally proud of our team. Our leadership team has responded in an amazing way, but every single individual in this organization in every cat job category has done things to make an impact in our community and in the lives of our students. Even those who were not designated as essential staff have done things like you see the teacher parades where teachers have gone out into communities in the, to wave at their students to make that personal connection. Many teachers have reached out to their um, reached out to their students to engage them even last week before we asked them to. Certainly custodians, food service workers, even bus drivers are coming in to do jobs that are not their normal job. So many people are working across all aspects of this organization to keep things going. But our reality is, is that more and more people are being identified as sick in our community and infected with the virus. So we are right now in the process of sending as many people home as we can to avoid um, contact. So we truly do have a skeleton staff, a truly essential staff working, and we're, we're expecting that staff to get even more lean as more people go home, because that's the only way we're gonna flatten this curve and stop the spread. So just know we're gonna keep providing the services to the best of our ability, especially if we can get teachers fully and trained up and engaged. But our reality is, is even essential staff need to be sent home as soon as possible. So again, we'll keep you informed. We'll keep our community informed. But for now, what I'd like to do is turn it back over to Mr. Burdine for any questions or responses from the board. Thank you, Dr. Dupree. This is Jason Burdine. Um, I'm going to start with Mrs. Kristen Tossan, she has a question or a comment or both. Go ahead, Mrs. Tossan. Yeah, this is Kristen Tossan. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate that. And um, I just want to say, I want to echo what uh, what Charles was saying. I don't think uh, anyone outside of, of education or outside of the district can really fully understand all that our staff and teachers and administration uh, have put into uh, trying to get things ready for our kids. And so I just want to publicly say, I know I've said it behind the scenes, but I want to publicly say thank you uh, to all of you for your work on this. I, I know you've been working around the clock. I know you all have the same challenges uh, every other household has with um, with family and and children and and just the challenges that this uh, virus has presented for all of us and on top of that you're worried about our kids our students and and getting them back to school and getting them the resources that they need and 
And I don't think anybody can fully understand the challenges uh, that you you guys have worked through. And and I know you'll overcome them. So I just wanted to say that at the outset. Um, thank you guys for taking care of our community by providing food. Um, I appreciate Oscar's update. I appreciate that we're going to be expanding schools uh, where where kids and families can go pick up meals. Um, to make it more convenient. So thank you for uh, for taking that that extra uh, job on for our community. I know that we had uh, had coordinated with the Houston Food Bank to have some uh, to have food trucks arrive for our families, and we had some um, I guess some miscommunication or something happened there. If Oscar gave this update, I apologize, but I wanted to ask. Um, if we had gotten that worked out with the Houston Food Bank and if they'll be uh, be showing up at, at some of our schools uh, so that our families can get uh, some of the food that they need. Yes, ma'am, that would be Anthony and Delicato who can respond to that. Yes, good evening, this is Anthony. Uh, we had coordinated a truck from the Houston Food Bank to be at Missouri City Middle School this past Friday. We had numerous confirmations and uh, Parents got there early. We had a very structured system. We collaborated with our extended learning department to have a numbering system. Uh, Chief Ryder had some officers there as well uh, to provide some support and help. And then we realized uh, about an hour and a half in, called the food bank and they just dropped the ball. Yeah. We had confirmations in email and writing and over the phone from them. So they acknowledged that. Um, they apologized to every family online. Luckily, we had good leadership there from our department that helped make sure that uh, all of our families have a number and in terms of the order they were in line. So even though they unfortunately some waited hours uh, for food, uh, we are uh, actually tomorrow morning at the same site, same time. Uh, the food truck is supposed to be there and we'll make sure that those families that waited did not lose that opportunity and no be the first ones to receive the food. And if there was additional leftover, then of course those next in line will receive that. So that was unfortunate, but we're making the best of that situation. Um, we do have a second food truck that's organized for this Friday at Kempner High School. Um, we'd love to have more trucks, but at this point, that's what the Houston Food Bank says that they can provide to us. But we are asking for more and we're hoping that uh, that will occur, but they're also trying to support other areas of our city. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you for that update. Um, so I'm sure there are going to be many, you know, glitches along the way with a lot of organizations. So we just appreciate that they're um, doing this for our community and, and coordinating with you guys to provide, um, you know, much needed uh, groceries and food for, for our community members. So thanks for following up with that and for coordinating that for our community members. Um, I also want to touch a little bit on, on Deanna's update. Uh, thank you. I, I know that we're a leader in the state in supporting our students in special education um, and, and working very hard to do all that we can, what's best. Uh, so thanks to Dina Hill and you, Dr. Dupree, for being part of that task force to ensure that our kids who are in special education um, get everything that they need, as well as our uh, as our English language learners. I think I, I know that some of our our students who have those extra uh, needs or or have extra challenges, um, in addition to, to technology challenges, uh, I know that those some of those are, are hills that we're going to have to climb. And I appreciate that we're not shying away from it, or not saying that we're not going to provide it. I know that the that Congress is looking right now at a bill, um, passing a bill that basically says we don't have to provide a free and appropriate public education at this time, um, with some saying that it's too difficult and we should just basically shove these kids to the side. And, um, you know, I for one want to say publicly that, that Fort Ben ISD is not going to do that. Uh, I don't care what the federal government says. These are our kids, these are our students, and and we need to do all we can to support them and provide what they need to the best of our ability. Not that there aren't going to be some challenges, but um, but you know I, I I appreciate that this district is is a leader, uh, not only in the state but in the nation in providing that. 
So I just want to confirm, Deanna, that um, you said that online learning, we will start pushing out uh, tools and expectations and trying to get virtual spaces set up for our students March 30th through April 2nd. Um, and you said it would look very much like the first week of school, so to speak. Um, just trying to make sure that we get every kiddo set up and and meeting their needs and determining what they need uh, if they haven't already been able to provide that through the survey. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. So that'll give us about four days um, for our teachers to to try to get uh, get things set up for our students. And then on April 3rd, you said online learning basically will begin. I, I take that to mean instruction. I just wanted you to describe for the board and for the community uh, what that's going to look like. Let's set their expectations on uh, what online learning or online instru instruction will be for their student. And it may be good to break it out into levels if that's pertinent, um, elementary versus secondary. Right. Um, so one of the things that I mentioned in my comments is that as we think about the online learning platform, there are some things that would be similar um, in terms of what we would do in a in a regular classroom, a face to face classroom. And that would be. But as we look at a, an online learning platform, delivery and modeling of content. So I'm going to give you an example, regardless of what level a teacher may um, video using we video a lesson um, that's going to push out content to kids or they may assign a Khan Academy video to students to uh, engage them in the learning of a particular content. Um, then, um, as I said before, we're going to push out to parents specific um, expectations associated with uh, grade level and content. So let me go back and share with you some specific um, information associated with like, for example, a kindergarten classroom. So a kindergarten classroom, um, if I'm looking at uh, Monday, we might share with the parents, um, we, we have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. On Monday, we might want them to spend with their kindergarten and first grade kids 15 minutes uh, with ELA, maybe 15 minutes with math, and then set aside about 15 minutes of independent reading because we know that the, um, the attention span of kids of that age may be a little bit more difficult, right? And then on Tuesday, it might look like 15 minutes of ELA, 15 minutes of math, 15 minutes of science. So, um, and then support for your child in terms of what PE, uh, what ways might you engage your kids physically to, to uh, address PE? And we'll also be posting online resources um, for um, wellness activities and things of that nature, character building and things that parents can, can work through um, in terms of activities for their kids. So Tuesday might be 60 total minutes of, of instruction that again, a family could determine what would those 60 minutes look like over the course of a day. Um, and if they had multiple children, it may be that they've set aside um, however they want to structure that. We've left that flexibility for parents and their families based on their needs and the number of kids um, they may need to, to, to service. Um, and so that's an example of what a Monday or a Tuesday might look like. Wednesday, we might go back to a similar schedule as Monday, um, where maybe there's about 45 minutes worth of total instructional time. And then Thursday, another 45 minutes and Friday, so that there's a consistent pattern for parents to engage their, their children, but it's realistic and reasonable uh, in, terms of what a, in terms of what a family might be able to manage and what teachers might be able to manage in terms of providing feedback and developing office hours for video conferencing where parents could, could chime in. Okay, good. So this is Kristen Tossan again. Um, thank you for that, Deanna. I, I'm glad that you said the word consistency. It's one of the words that I wrote down. Um, having three in my household, I can imagine how this could blow up, you know, really quickly for a parent 
um, having multiple students in one household. So I think consistency is going to be key. Uh, you talked about communication. I think clear commun and concise communication is going to be key and setting expectations for how much support we expect within the home. You know, how much are are the kids going to just go out and get on their own through the, the videos, as you suggested, or through, you know, engaging with Schoology and maybe turning in quizzes? I know my, my kids have done that in the past on their own. Um, and then how much parental support is really going to be needed? I know that there are some parents who are essential and who still are working. Uh, some are still working from home so that, of course, they're going to be juggling working from home in addition to trying to support their kids. So I, I, I think the flexibility is great, allowing for that flexibility. Um, but uh, I just want to make sure that we're communicating very clearly what our expectations are for our parents. Absolutely. And um, as I said, we'll have some front facing uh, information that will be pushed out to parents uh, via the SchoolEG platform um, so that they understand what would a typical day look like? Um, and which is why it's important for us before we get into the formal stage, which would launch April 3rd, that there's opportunities for parents to begin to develop those systems and structures in their homes. Um, that was also the intent of releasing the in-home learning activities so that some semblance of structure could begin to build leading up to, as we said, March 30th and re-engaging kids and, and setting up a more formal uh, virtual learning um, space in their in their homes. And that was helpful. So I appreciate you guys doing that. I know I heard from a lot of parents who were very appreciative, appreciative of that platform being pushed out uh, kind of along these same lines. Are we going to or when are we going to be communicating? Do we know? Um, grades, grading policy. Uh, I don't know if we're going to need any kind of uh, uh, for the board to engage in any kind of uh, policy change or if it's just a procedural um, type of change. I know we have a certain number of daily grades we normally require. Is that going to be relaxed? I mean, you guys may not have answers to that yet, but can we let the community know when they can expect to be seeing some of that? We do. Uh, that That is something that there are some decision points that uh, we've articulated via the design team that we need to focus on. And um, we will be communicating what our T3 um, grade landscape looks like soon. Um, prior to launching anything, there will also be specific information associated with expectations and what that would mean in terms of grading beyond um, our, our T3, and T3 is just our, our, our third grading period. Um, so we will be communicating out soon um, within the week uh, information about what that might look like. And then um, as we push out information uh, associated with launching and ramping up for online learning, we'll include expectations for grading for parents in that as well. Okay, good. And I know you guys have said to us, and I know that you will continue to be mindful of particularly our, our juniors and our seniors and those who are, the way this is going to impact rankings and, and those types of things. Uh, I know you guys are working hard on that. And uh, I don't really have a question around it. I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, that we all know it and that you guys are aware of it and are working on it. So um, So thank you for that. My last question, I guess, is to maybe to Dr. Dupree. Um, I, I know that you said we're we're trying to only project out our closure maybe a couple of weeks at a time. Uh, I think that's uh, that's prudent for us to do that. Uh, maybe even take it week by week. So my question, uh, well, first of all, kudos to you guys on communication uh, and transparency. I, it, it, I know it has helped me as I've. Uh, answered questions from the community, so I appreciate that. Um, when do you think our next update will be for for the community? Um, and when do you think uh, do you think that that will include, um, you know, a projection about whether school closure will continue? And then, I guess along those lines, um, 
perhaps an update on 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 what we're talking about right here when we plan to go uh, live with online learning and set those expectations. I've seen a lot of community questions around that, uh, and so I, I know we're kind of uh, uh, we're kind of at a good place right now where parents are. It might be good to give them an update on that. Yes. Yeah, so there's a couple of different updates that we're working on. First, so the, the broader update about the the long term closing, we're going to engage. We're going to keep doing minor updates to the community to let them know we're going to make major any major decisions the week of April the sixth. Um, that's the next opportunity we'll have. And of course, many things are going to hinge on what happens from the state level and even our local county level. So, but we're we're going to keep communicating that in real time as it occurs or just reminders about when we're going to be coming back to the community to keep them informed. In regard to learn online learning right now, you know, we did last week, we sent a communication on Friday. Actually, we sent one on Wednesday and Friday to kind of set the stage for when the time frames. But as you mentioned, we need to keep letting them know what's coming. So we are planning another communication for tomorrow. There'll be another Thursday or Friday. That's kind of the get ready, get ready, get ready. So encouraging more engagement with the online um, activities that are currently available with more firm direct information about when they may expect to begin actual instruction with their teachers. So that that's going to be coming out a couple of times this week as we as we prepare to launch that. OK, great. That sounds great. Um, are we planning to push that out in some kind of written format for those who may not be getting those online or video messages? Well, everything we're doing has been pretty much via email, video and social media. Those are the we're not planning to do any mailings or anything like that. We are focusing more on the digital type of deliveries, but we do use the um, the blackboard that goes into every parent's text messaging and email account as well. So we do have multiple measures that we would use on a typical school day. OK, good. Yeah, that might be important to maybe at least push those dates out in order for them to prepare. Maybe let them know that they can go check their emails and that kind of thing. I find that sometimes parents are saying their emails are not getting lost or, or they are getting lost or that they're not receiving them for one reason or another. So that might be helpful. Thank you guys. Thanks to the whole team. Uh, really excellent work um, during what's been a, a difficult crisis, I know. Thank you, Mrs. Tossan. Um, Mrs. Helliger. Hi, this is Addie Helliger. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. All right. So um, thank you, Dr. Dupree and staff for all the work that you all have done so far with keeping our uh, community abreast of in this in this unprecedented situation. I do have a couple of questions. Um, I think I wanna make sure that we, I guess just to piggyback a little bit on um, Mrs. Tassan's statement is that we aren't expecting all of our um, homeschool's children to have a full day. Is that correct? I just wanna make sure that I emphasize that. Deanna, would you like to address that? Um, what I would say is um, in terms of a full day, what um, we've given uh, parents or we will be giving parents um, information uh, and content level expectations in terms of a minimum amount of engagement that we would expect in that online platform. Should a, should a family uh, want to engage uh, longer because there's going to be practice there there still may be homework and things but in terms of engaging in the platform itself we're giving uh, expectations in terms of the amount of time each day that they should formally engage um, does that make sense yes it does make sense they said they can't see me mm -hmm. um all right so yes. I, I i gave an example of a kinder and first grade but a differentiated, um, so if we thought about a middle school kid, uh, it might, that might go from 45 minutes, which was what I indicated for a, for a kindergarten kid, to more like 120 minutes of engagement uh, when you're talking about a middle school student and possibly up to 150 or more for a high school student. 
Okay, so then, mm -hmm. so then once we actually um, have, I guess, the regulation of how much minutes, how much time we'll, we have to do and how this is going to be credited back to us or credited to the students, I just want to make sure that we're, we're mindful of the fact that we have, we do have parents that are still working that we don't have parents that are, I mean, we have parents that are at home and available yeah. to engage 100%, but we have parents that will not be able to engage at 100% and they will still be working. And we wanna make sure that um, students aren't necessarily penalized for that. So whatever the minimal, you know, standard would be through this whole process is what, you know, I would be looking for, so. That's good. I'd like to speak to that because you've raised an excellent point. And I do want to share that in talking to the commissioner, he has made it clear that all the minutes that were held accountable for from the state level, that's all suspended at this point. The goal is we we have to be able to demonstrate that we are making efforts to educate our children, even while they're out of school. And what you just described, Ms. Helliger, is something we're spending a lot of time talking about because even our own teaching staff Many of them have children of their own, and they've got to be able to balance delivering instruction to the students that they serve while meeting their own child's needs at home. And not to even mention parents who work in corporate America or in other types of jobs outside of education. So that is your that's a very legitimate concern. And I think we're trying to manage expectations with our parents that our children and even students. I, I was visiting with a group of students today online and they were asking well are we going to meet with every class every day and i said no that is not feasible you're not going to see all seven teachers every single day i said what well, it's going to feel and look very different so that we're going to have to manage those expectations to make sure that this teaching staff and the students and the parents understand it's going to be very abbreviated but it's still designed to accomplish a form of education that's very but even though it's different um the other thing I was going to add just in, and you did not specifically ask this, but I think it's important every chance I get, especially publicly, I want to make sure our parents and community understand this is not an optional engagement. Our children are expected to be in school and they're expected to participate with us and their parents are going to have to accept that responsibility. And just like we do with any child on any given day, we will be working with the parent to meet their unique needs, whatever their schedule may be, their needs. But we do need parents and children to accept responsibility and take seriously the fact that they need to engage in the learning opportunities that we're offering them. All right, thank you. Thank you. And I think my last question is, um, <clears throat> has there any has there been any discussion yet around, um, I guess, makeup days, I guess that goes along with what you just said, based on there's no minutes necessarily um, that are required per day, but will there be makeup days per se? And I've been getting a lot of I've been getting a lot of questions around that. So that's an excellent question. And I, and I, I yeah, the way you framed it is the right way, in my view, because it's not makeup of existing time. Well, the reality we're going to have to deal with is that despite our best, very best efforts, many, many children are going to have gaps in their learning because of their losing the last nine weeks of school. So it's very possible, to, again, depending on the cycle of the virus, we could, if we can't get back to school in April or May, we could be coming back to the board asking to start school in July or the 1st of August or something to be able to recapture some of that time in the next school year. So the way I've been framing it I told when I talk when I talk to groups is we may have the longest school year ever follow, you know, right on the heels of the shortest school year ever. But uh, the bottom line is we've got to be looking for the best interest of our kiddos. If you think of the special education students, many of them are not going to be able to receive the required minutes from their IEP and we're going to be doing compensatory services for them simply because we're trying to do things on a minimal online schedule no matter how much we try to meet their needs this year. Any student is at risk of having gaps in their learning. You think of the algebra student who misses the last nine weeks, they're not going to be ready for geometry. So what that means for us is we're going to have to make some hard decisions about when we do resume, what does it look like? How much of the curriculum are we going to have to repackage and reorder 
and maybe even put some concepts from Algebra 2 into geometry, you know, to be able to make sure students have the runway to be successful when they do resume in the courses that they have. They're, you know, today our, fo our focus has been on right now, getting kids back to learning today, but as soon as we get that up and running, we're going to then begin focusing our attentions on the long term and what it means when we bring kids back full time into our buildings. But you're but you're absolutely asking the right questions. OK, thank you so much. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Mrs. Helliger. Mrs. James. Thank you, Jason. This is Grail James. And um, thank you for uh, Thank you for uh, all the great information. I'm just so impressed with the staff and all the work that's gone on, all the work that you've all put in. This looks so well thought out. And, um, and what I hear too is you recognize the obstacles. Because I, I just want to pick up on a couple of things that, that Kristen said and, and Addie said too, and that is um, this is, we don't know how long this is going to go on, so we have to. We're planning for the long term, and we don't. We're going to struggle with equity because not everybody is going to have access, either through because of technology, because of their situation at home, because of a hundred different reasons, probably seventy-five thousand different reasons. Um, so I guess what I'm hearing you say is. We're going to address that as best we can in the short term. And maybe this is my first question. Make sure that I heard it correctly. You're going to address that as best as you can in the short term. And then as we get to understand the landscape in the long term, come up with a, a, a broader plan or a, a bigger plan. Is that accurate? Yes, ma'am. That's exactly right. Um, because the way I've been framing it with staff and that we've talked about very openly, we have children in our communities today who could do very well at home with mom and dad with a few resources we send because they have the cultural capital, they have the parents who are equipped and prepared to drive their students learning. We have other children, no matter how much we give them or how many efforts we make, they're going to still struggle. And that's actually what you've hit on is the is the comments I've been making to the commissioner is all of these efforts are fine and good across the state. And but I told him, I said, Fort Bend ISD is going to do it better than anybody, but we're still going to have equity problems that are it's just inherent in the way this system is, is going to be structured from everything from the logistics of the devices to mom and dad's availability and capacity and bandwidth to be able to serve their children to language barriers, everything you can imagine we have in our district. So equity is an issue and I appreciate you bringing that up because that's the piece. We are doing our very best to address it, but it's going to be very difficult in the near term and it'll be difficult in the long term. Even though we'll have all these kiddos back in our building, it's, it's going to place a burden on them, their parents and the teaching staff to try to close those gaps in the near term. OK, so thank you for that. And I think what I hear you saying through through this evening's presentation, too, is and I want to. Well, first, let me say I really appreciate the at home learning resources that you've already put out there. I've gotten very good feedback. People very excited about what was out there and being able to put some structure into their day. They want their kids to be learning and they want they didn't know how to do it. So that is Thank you for providing that resource. I think it's I think it's going to be very, very helpful. I guess what I so what I hear you say is we're going to have some gaps. We're going to have some some places where we're going to have to make up make up time, make up learning time really for kids. And we're going to but we're not going to we're not going to leave anybody behind. So parents that are upset or frustrated that they don't know what to do or they don't they can't get their computer to work or whatever it is we've got we're going to put plans in place to help to help those families yes ma'am that's exactly what we're saying okay that's great and i i want to say too you know we've talked a lot in the boardroom about students owning their own learning and this has come a little bit quicker than we expected 
We didn't want them to have to be doing it when we didn't quite have everything in place for it. Um, but maybe, again, this is an opportunity where we'll learn some lessons about what works and what, do, what doesn't work. And maybe there's some opportunity to learn, um, you know, some best practices. Um, because as, as some of your staff has already said, Dr. Dupree, there's so many creative things going on already that I see posted on social media, I've seen on YouTube, and it's pretty exciting to see those sort of creative and innovative things. And I'm excited um, about what other creative and innovative things will, will, that we'll come up with um, through this journey. So I just want to comment on that and I appreciate your staff's really truly remarkable effort, their, their, um, their commitment to this, their understanding that the students are a priority and I really, the hours that you've put in and the team has put in and, and, and many of the teachers, you know, are, are, are uh, working hard and I just appreciate all of that and you know, all the work that's gonna go forward. It's, we're gonna be working in a new way and we all, look at us, we're having a board meeting through a video chat and everybody's gonna be work, learning to work in a new way and, uh, it's it's um, I just appreciate all all the district's efforts in that and the staff's efforts. Thank you. Uh, one other comment I wanted to make, um, and this is um, getting to something that Mrs. Uh, Tossan mentioned about governance issues, and I know you know we've got our kind of our our our, our uh, way we've done business in place, but I recognize that things may have to change and things may be different and our priorities might be a little bit different going forward. So um, I just want to say that I'm open to learning what that's going to be and help and learning to reprioritize things um, as we figure out sort of our the board's role in this kind of new situation. So uh, that's my final comment. Thank you very much, Mrs. James. Mr. Rosenthal. <clears throat> yes, thank you. This is Dave Rosenthal. So, um, I, I, I had uh, several comments, probably echo a lot of what, what's already been said. Um, and first, I, I would also like to thank um, Charles and the E-Team. I think you guys are, are doing wonders under just unprecedented circumstances. Um, I think in the end, I think a lot of districts around the state are really going to look up and to, to see what we accomplished, uh, what we learned. And um, so I think we're going to be a source of, um, of experience for the rest of the state and who knows, maybe the country. Um, and so I, I do, I appreciate the, the planning. You're not, you haven't just rushed into trying to get curriculum out there just for the sake of having it out there. and and. Uh, Charles, I was wanting to respond to what Addie was saying, and I was writing the word manage expectations. This is the second time in two of these online meetings that you were saying something as I was writing that same phrase. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I think Addie's right. I, I, you know, there's no way that, that kids are going to be learning seven, eight hours a day, you know, through online activity. Uh, it, it, so, I appreciate you making that comment and I, and I hope that people understand that. Um, and um, the other thing, I, and <clears throat> a couple of things, um, I wanted to, uh, you know, I, I guess I had thought a little bit about um, the impact in the future. You know, this is gonna impact kids all throughout next year. Uh, and it's going to impact kids differently across the district. Um, it'll impact kids differently within the same schools. And so it's going to be a huge challenge to catch up uh, from all this because, again, they're not, kids are not going to get the, the same experience as they would be inside the schools. Um, and so I'm sure you guys are, are thinking of, of, you know, strategies, you know, or will be as, as we learn more. And um, so, I wanted to also ask, has there been any discussion with the commissioner, because I know some colleges are doing this already, about um, 
uh, pass fail uh, options instead of actually worrying about grades, trying to trying to grade student work. Um, and of course, that that's going to have an impact on um, college selection and class rank and top 10 percent and all that stuff. And um, and, and again, I, you don't it, you know, I just want to know if there's been discussion about that. You don't have to, you know, put stuff out there if you're not ready to put it out there. Um, yes, so. uh, Mr. Rosenthal, grading is actually a local decision. And so this comes back to what Ms. Tossan mentioned earlier. This that is part of our conversation. What we're studying right now is what's in the best interest of all students. And in particular, we're keeping our eye on those high school kiddos who every point matters in regard to their class rank, which, could, as you mentioned, affects many things for their future. So we are looking at that as a possibility. And we're also studying it compared to policy to determine if any board action would be required. So we are not ready to really roll out the full plan, but we are, there's that is one of the components we're discussing. OK, well, again, I, I appreciate everything that, that you guys are doing and um, <clears throat> hang in there. It's uh, uh, I, I thank would like to thank all the, 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 the teachers and whatnot and the curriculum folks who are who are putting in their time and uh, just trying to make uh, make uh, a good situation out of out of a bad situation. So thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. Um, I appreciate all the trustees comments. There's been a lot of wonderful things said, and I think this has been a great conversation. And as it's been stated before, Dr. Dupree, I can't say thank you enough to you and your staff and the E-team and all the teachers and everyone involved there at admin during these unprecedented, unprecedented times. I continue to be encouraged by our creativity and leadership. And you know, once again, thank you for the countless hours and sacrifices that staff is making um, so that we can keep our kids safe, keep our kids fed, and, and get our kids back on track to learning. And our board supports the, the efforts. And, um, and we will, uh, it'll be exciting to see uh, how we can um, move forward because I know that we're going to be leaders as as uh, Mr. Rosenthal said in the state and uh, likely even the nation. So um, I'm really encouraged and and, uh, and and the board really thanks you for that. So um, and just one more closing comment uh, when we're on this COVID-19 topic, you know, something that I've learned over the last few days is, is as we see these numbers come out and, and you see how many people have been tested and how many people have been infected. Um, the numbers are, are not an example of, of the, the numbers are not true. We have very, very few tests um, in this state right now, and there are likely hundreds of thousands of more people that are infected that are not even reported because they just have a fraction of the test available. And I'm saying that to say, please be careful, everybody. Um, we, we, we can't educate our kids without being safe and healthy, and we have our community depending upon us. And um, be cautious, listen to, to what um, the information that's being put out there, and uh, let's continue on in a healthy, positive way and, uh, and keep our kids moving forward and educated. Um, we will now convene in close, before we, before we go into closed session, I wanna remind all the trustees, Please make sure that you turn your camera off and your microphone is muted. Make, your, make sure your camera's off and your microphone is muted. And the login uh, phone number was sent to you um, to, to call in so that we can have our closed session. So we will now convene in closed session under Texas Open Meeting Act. Texas Government Code Chapter 551 under the following sections for the purpose of a private consultation with the board's attorney on any or all subject matters authorized by law to consider purchase.